بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We concluded last week's lesson by looking at the number of times the Quraysh sent a delegation to Abu Talib, the uncle of Rasulullah telling him to convince Rasulullah not to continue preaching that there is one God, that there is one Allah telling him to tell Rasulullah to stop preaching that he is the messenger of Allah, that he is the Rasul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to stop preaching that angels exist, to stop preaching that when somebody passes away they will be resurrected and they will be questioned regarding their actions and their deeds in this world, to stop preaching that there is life after death, to stop preaching that there is Jannah and Jahannam, that there is heaven and hell, and to stop preaching that, and more importantly, to stop chastising their false gods and their idols. So as I mentioned in last week's lesson that Abu Talib spoke to Rasulullah but Rasulullah said to Abu Talib that I am not going to give this mission up, even though you may are trying to convince me, even though you are my uncle, even though I love you dearly, but I'm not going to leave this message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm not going to let go of this order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this responsibility and this duty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when the Quraysh saw that Abu Talib was trying to convince Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was having none of it, and also on top of that, the Quraysh were seeing that gradually and slowly, slowly, many Muslims, many people were converting towards Islam, many, many people were becoming Muslims. The Quraysh then thought to themselves that what should we do, what can we do to stop the number of Muslims from converting, to stop these people, the people leaving their forefathers' religion, and becoming Muslims. So what they firstly decided to do was that we are going to start persecuting and start torturing Muslims. So that if these Muslims, if they, tort- if they are tortured, then either they will now let go of the region and revert back to their forefathers' region, or the very least it will act as a deterrent to stop other people from becoming Muslims. And a good example, and we're going to look at this later on as well in detail, a good example of that will be of Hazrat Bilal anhu, the Muazzin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that when he converted to Islam, he was tortured, he was beaten, he was bruised up by his master, and then on top of that, he didn't leave him there so that he could like recover from his wounds and his injury, but instead what he would do is that afterwards he would then place Hazrat Bilal anhu with his uh, back facing and um, touching the hot scorching Arabian desert when it's really, really hot, so that the wound and the injury, instead of healing, it will actually sting and it will actually hurt you. So this is how they were torturing the Muslims. Obviously, we'll look at this in uh, de- detail later. So they thought that this will stop Mus- these people from converting to Islam. But it's instead, on the contrary, we saw actually many people converting towards Islam. And a comparison can be also drawn to this particular day and age, where we see many people saying bad things about Islam, saying that Islam is a religion which preaches terrorism, all the kind of things about there's no rights for women, this and that, all these things about the burqa and the hijab, kind of restricting women, it's not freedom for women and so on and so forth. So all these things are being said about Islam, all these bad things are being said about Rasulullah about religion, about Islam. But what we see is that many people in their hundreds, in their thousands every year are converting to Islam. So exactly here, 1400 years ago, 
they thought that they are going to stop Islam by persecuting the Muslims, but instead he actually led to many people leaving their forefathers' religion and coming towards Islam. Exactly same in this day and age as well, that they thought that by saying bad things about Islam, it's going to stop people from entering Islam. But instead, on the contrary, we see many, many people, hundreds and thousands, converting to Islam every year. And a good example of that can be seen the way Hazrat Hamza, anhu, the uncle of Rasulullah, converted towards Islam. Now, Hazrat Hamza, anhu, he's the uncle of Rasulullah, he was only two years older than Rasulullah. And also at the same time, Hazrat Hamza anhu was Rasulullah's foster brother. Rasulullah and Hazrat Hamza anhu were breastfed by Halima Sa'di. So not only was Hazrat Hamza Rasulullah's uncle, but he was also his foster brother. Now what happened was that once Rasulullah was walking by Man Safa, when he met Abu Jahl. Now Abu Jahl again was another uncle of Rasulullah but he was a staunch enemy of Islam. And when he saw his nephew, Ayy Rasulullah he started saying all this foul stuff at Rasulullah using foul language at Rasulullah swearing at Rasulullah rebuking at Rasulullah Now there was a slave girl at that time who belonged to Abdullah bin Jad'an and she witnessed everything that Rasulullah was being criticized, was being chastised by Abu Jahl, being sworn upon. All these foul language was used against Rasulullah so she witnessed everything. And at the same time, Hazrat Hamza who at that time hadn't converted to Islam, he was returning back from a hunting expedition. The slave girl then said to Hazrat Hamza that you should have been there, you should have witnessed what Abu Jahl was saying to Rasulullah Sometimes it happens that when something bad happens or when somebody's honor is uh, taken away, when someone is humiliated, we then say, oh, you should have been there when he was like humiliated or you should have been there when this person was like being sworn at and so on. So exactly here, this slave girl was saying to Hazrat Hamza that, oh, you should have been there when Rasulullah was being chastised, was being sworn upon by Abu Jahl. Now when Hazrat Hamza who heard this, remember he wasn't a Muslim at that time, he heard this, this anger kind of grew in his heart. That Abu Jahl, remember Abu Jahl was Hazrat Hamza's elder brother. He said, Abu Jahl, my elder brother, he said this about my nephew. So again, the love he had for Rasulullah that he said this, he like saw out my nephew. So what happened? As the Hamza, he then went to the Haram, he saw Abu Jahl, he got his shield and he whacked Abu Jahl with his shield, causing Abu Jahl's head to uh, a wound or a uh, gash appear there, causing Abu Jahl to bleed. This is what we call, as I said, t- touched on this many times before, the love for Rasulullah He wasn't a Muslim at that time, but he couldn't take it that somebody saw a Rasulullah his beloved nephew, so what happened? He got his shield and he went and he hit his elder brother. Just imagine if any of our elder brother or someone was to say anything bad about Rasulullah, we would just say, oh, forget it, you know, he's my elder brother, I can't do anything to him. But look at Hazrat Hamza al got his shield, went to the Haram in front of everyone, went and smacked uh, his elder brother, Abu Jahl, for saying bad things about Rasulullah, causing his elder brother to start bleeding from his head. And when people saw this, they were shocked and saying, like, oh, oh, Hamza, have you become a Muslim? Have you become a Bedin? Have you left our forefathers' religion? So Hazrat Hamza Bilan, who in front of everyone said that, yes, I have uh, left our forefathers' religion and I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I believe in what he says. So this is an example of Hazrat Hamza Bilan, who becoming a Muslim even though at that time Muslims were being persecuted, Muslims were being tortured, but he showed, you know, he basically fought back, you know, one man, like, he was fighting back, and he converted to Islam in front of everyone. So again, this was an example of, even though, you know, people may say bad things about Islam, 
hidayat and guidance is down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one can stop that. Even though people may make all these plans and deceptions to stop people from converting, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he has got hidayat written in somebody's heart, then that person will find hidayat and will find guidance. Another point which we can gather from this particular incident is looking at it from a more suluk and more from a tasawwuf and a tasqiyah point of view is this anger. Now as I mentioned before that anger is one of the traits or one of the things which we as human beings have been created with. We have two things which are inherent uh, within us. They are number one, shahwa, desire, and number two, anger. Now, desires and anger is something which we cannot totally eradicate. Other kind of desires and vile characteristics of our heart, as I touched on before, such as pride, pride, arrogance, takabur, jealousy, these kind of things, these are bad, and if it's in our heart, we should get rid of them. But two things such as anger and such as desires, they can never ever leave us. It's always going to be there. And that's why it's mentioned in the hadith of Muslim the Ahmad that Rasulullah has said that if somebody tells you that a mountain has moved from its place, then you should believe it. But if somebody tells you that somebody has changed his sitra, someone has changed his nature, then fala tusaddikuhu, then don't believe it. Why? Because these things like anger and desire, it can never ever go out of a person's heart. Even though he may be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time, he will still have desire there. Even though he may be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time, the anger, the ghadab will always be there. But what the tawwuf and what the tzkiyah teaches us is that we should use or we should channel the anger we should channel the desires in the right places. We can't totally eradicate anger, but we should use anger in the right places. We can't totally eradicate lust and desires, but we should use the lust and desire for those who are halal for us, i.e. our wives. That's what the skia, that's what the tawwuf is channeling, channeling us to do, that we should channel our anger, we should channel the lust and desires in the rightful places, and not, and when it comes to anger in particular, not to use it in the wrong places, not to use it in petty issues. Now, I was saying here that, look, at this is the example of anger when we should use anger. Not use anger when it's for minor issues or for petty issues, but when we see somebody rebuking Rasulullah someone criticizing Rasulullah someone knows the Billah, swearing at Rasulullah that's when we should use the anger. Any form of disrespect against Rasulullah that's when we should use the anger. That's when we should get the ghayrat. That's when we should actually have this kind of feeling in our heart that look, you know, the message of Allah, the Prophet of Allah, you know, such and such a person is, you know, ridiculing him, such as a person ridiculing the sunnah, that's when we get angry. That's when we should channel and use our particular anger. Not in petty issues, not in minor issues. Exactly same as Hazrat Hamza who did, that when he heard that his elder brother Abu Jahl was saying bad things about Rasulullah وسلم, that's when he used the anger and he showed it in terms of lashing out at his brother. Now they were saying that the Quraysh they were making many many plans and devices to stop Islam from spreading so one way was that they thought that if we were to torture or persecute the Muslims then that will stop the flow of people converting to a Islam. They then thought of another avenue and they thought that, okay, let's try to tempt Rasulullah with wealth, with women, and it could be so that then Rasulullah may give up his mission, may give up preaching the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's mentioned in the hadith that the chief or the leaders of the Quraysh, they got together and they appointed Utba bin Rabia to go to Rasulullah وسلم, and give him or tempt him with dunya, with wealth and see that whether he, i.e. Rasulullah وسلم, gives up the message of Allah and gives up the mission. And it's mentioned in the hadith that 
Utba bin Rabi'a, he came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that, O oh Muhammad, your message, your preaching has caused a rift within the community. It has caused a husband to separate from his wife. It has caused a father to be separate from his son. It has caused a mother to get separated from her daughter. So he then asked uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that, Oh Muhammad, what is your aim with this message? What is your aim of giving da'wah? What is your aim of you preaching the oneness of Allah, preaching that you are the prophet and the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Then Utbah bin Rabiya then went on to say that, look, if you want dunya, if you want mal, if you want wealth, we will give you all the wealth of Arabia. If you want women, then we will give you all the women of the Quraysh, the most beautiful women of the Quraysh, we will give her to you and you could marry her. If you want leadership, if you want hukumat, if you want kingdom, then we will give you all of Makkah, Mukarramah, you could have this and you could run it the way you want. Now when Rasulullah heard what Utbah had to say, he then replied and he said to Utbah that, look, I am not here to take your wealth or to take your mal. I'm not here to get married to whatever woman you choose for me or whatever woman you want to give to me. I'm not here for leadership, I'm not here for power, I'm not here for kingdom. But I have been sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am a Bashir, I have been sent by Allah to give glad tidings that those who do good, those who believe, those who convert to Islam, they will enter Jannah, they will enter paradise. And I am a Nazir. I have been sent as a warner to warn people that those who don't believe in me, those who don't believe in Allah, those who don't believe in life after death, those who don't believe in the hereafter, then they will enter the fire of hell and they will remain there forever and ever. So that again was another kind of ploy they tried to use to stop the Muslims from uh, converting to Islam, to stop people sorry, to convert to Islam and that is that, okay, let's try to Tell Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that so can he can give up his mission. Another way or another avenue they later chose was okay. Let's try to reconcile with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Let's try to do sulah or let's try to do a treaty between us and the Muslims and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So what happened was another time a group of Quraysh the leaders, they came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said, O Rasulullah, O Prophet of Allah, O Muhammad, let's have a deal. You worship our idols for one year and we will worship your idols for another year. So they tried everything, they tried persecuting Muslims, they thought, that, okay, let's tempt Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with wealth and with women. And thirdly, they said, okay, let's have a kind of agreement, a kind of a treaty where okay for one year you worship our idols and the next year we will worship your God and your Allah and we'll go like this for until you know something happens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then reveals the surah, surah kafirun. And Allah says, Kul ya ayyuhal kafirun. The O Muhammad say to the disbelievers, say to the pagan, La a'budu ma ta'budun that I am not going to worship what you are worshipping. And then Allah says, وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا أَعْبُدُ That these pagans of Makkah, they shall never worship what you are worshipping. I this again is another deception of this. They will say that, okay, we will worship your God for a year. They never ever do it. Similarly, Allah is saying to Rasulullah sallam that you don't fall in their trap and you start worshipping their idols because that can never happen as I mentioned before Rasulullah sallam preaching the oneness of Allah he can never ever give an order or he himself can never ever worship idols so Allah is saying to Rasulullah sallam that look you don't worship their idols and on top of that Allah then says that look these people if they were to just say by chance you did say that okay we will do this they will never ever worship me anyway wala antum abiduna ma a'bud and then lastly, the surah finishes off by Allah saying, لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَالْيَدِينَ They say to them that look for you is your religion, so you want to carry on 
worshipping idols and worshipping your false gods, then fair enough, we will see the result or the consequence in the hereafter. And then for us is our deen and our religion. And from here we can derive that when it comes to like deen or when it comes to Islam, Islam means submission, as I touched on many times before, which means that you enter Islam properly and you submit yourself totally to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wills and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands. And this is and this is the reason why another verse in the Holy Quran was revealed, but this time regarding Abdullah bin Salam Radhiallahu Anhu. Now Abdullah bin Salam Radhiallahu Anhu, as you probably many of you are aware, he was a Jewish rabbi, but he later converted to Islam. Now when he converted to Islam, he then he didn't ask Rasulullah, but he thought to himself that look, I was a Jew before. What I'll do is that certain commands from the Torah, as long as it doesn't conflict with the Sharia or conflict with the Quran, I'll act upon it. And there were two things which he exactly would do. There were he would consider or he would continue worshipping on the Saturday. Because remember in Islam obviously our holy day is Friday for the Jews, it's on a Saturday. So what he thought is that okay, I'll convert to Islam. So on Friday, I'll go to the masjid and I'll worship with the Muslims and so on. But on the Saturday, I'll also do my own kind of, uh, you know, individual worship at home. Not going to the temple, not going to the synagogue, but myself, I'll just worship Allah on the Saturday. And another thing which Abdullah bin Salam who did was, in the Torah, it mentioned that it is impermissible for the Jews to consume camel meat. Whereas for Muslims, it's permissible. So when he converted to Islam, he said that, look, uh, I'll just make camel meat haram upon me. Obviously, you know, it's not like obligatory that you have to eat camel meat as a Muslim. But at the same time, there's no ruling for Islam saying that oh, you could make that haram upon yourself. So what did Abdullah bin Salam do? He made camel meat, the consuming of camel meat haram. Why? Because it was considered haram in the Torah. So he started kind of mixed and matching both of the religions. So therefore the Quranic verse was revealed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, those who believe, udkhulu fi silmi kafa. Which means enter into the fold of Islam, kafa, i.e. exclusively. Not like, you know, keeping some of the uh, practices of the previous religion and half and half, no. Enter into Islam, but enter into Islam 100% properly, Submit yourself to Allah's command. So this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa regarding when the pagans came and they said, okay, let's do, you know, a, you know mix and match here, you know, we worship a bit of your eyes, you know, so, you know, something like that. Allah said that, no, don't listen to them, don't believe them, because Islam is that there's no need for us to imitate and copy other religions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Sharia, the Sunnah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, quite beautifully has explained how to believe in Allah, how to obey Allah, how to listen to Allah, how to live your life as a true Muslim and as a true believer. There's no need for us to copy and to imitate and use other sharias and other kind of rulings and commands from previous religions. Because as I mentioned before, in the tafsir many times that when Rasulullah came with the sharia of Islam, he abrogated the previous religion. So what was mentioned in the Torah is gone now, it's finished. What was mentioned in the Bible is gone. What we have is the Qur'an, what mankind has is the Qur'an and is the ways of Rasulullah and this is what they have to act upon. This is what we need to you know, keep or uh, hold on to, you know, put, uh, remain steadfast on to until the day of judgment. Now as I was mentioning that these were the things which the Quraysh were doing trying to stop Muslims from converting. Also at the same time they made many, many silly and really stupid demands and requests to Rasulullah They would come to Rasulullah they would say to Rasulullah that, okay, if you are claiming to be a prophet of Allah, if you are claiming to be a messenger of Allah, this city of Mecca which you are living in is very, very small, it's very, very like narrow and very, very tight. Pray to Allah that make this city bigger. They would sometimes come to Rasulullah and say that, you know, pray to Allah that send us an angel so that, you know, this angel will tell us 
that you are a true prophet of Allah. What I'm trying to say is that they will make all these kind of uh, requests or they will make all these demands that, okay, if you're a prophet of Allah, you know, send the angel or if you're a prophet of Allah, send like, you know, rivers or send these kind of beautiful gardens and so on so that we can believe in you that you are a messenger and you are a prophet of Allah. There were other requests that they would sometimes make that, you know, send a, a kind of uh, a stair going towards the heaven so that we can climb the stair and then we can ask Allah that, are you a prophet of Allah, are you a messenger of Allah? These kind of silly remarks or silly kind of demands they would make on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now remember, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in all these remarks, he would always reply by saying that, look, it's not up to me to decide whether Allah sends the angel or not, whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to widen Makkah Mukarramah, whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to place rivers and streams. Miracles come because of Allah. Come because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. It's not like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decides a miracle. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to, He will show a miracle. And this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying to the people that look, I don't decide when a miracle comes. It's only when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides or He wants, He will show a miracle. But the problem is that these people, they were asking for miracles, but these miracles they were asking for, they were asking in other, in other meaning, due to rebellious, that being rebellious and not with the intention to believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And similarly people in this day and age as well, the last few questions, it could be questions about the Tawwuf, about Tazkiyah. Sometimes they're asking because they want to really know about the Tawwuf and Tazkiyah, but sometimes they're asking just to be rebellious, just to like, you know, put you off guard, just to like put doubts and so on and so forth. So exactly here as well that they were asking for miracles, but even to the extent that if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was to show them clear, clear miracles, they would not believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And a good example of that, I may have mentioned this before, and we're going to look at it later on as well, regarding the splitting of the meat. A very famous miracle mentioned in the Quran, Iqtarabat al-Sa'atu wa al-Shaq al that they said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet of Allah, this moon, which is in front of us, can you split it in half and we will believe in you? Now when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam split the moon into half and he like split it and it was physically done that one piece of the moon was on this side of the mountain the other part of the moon was on the other side of the mountain and when they clearly saw this Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them okay, you clearly see it they said yes Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then put it back together and when he put it back together they then started saying to themselves, oh, Rasulullah sallallahu is a magician. He just like, you know, did a trick here. He just like split the moon. In reality, he didn't split the moon. So what I'm trying to say is that even if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa showed them things clearly, if Allah showed them things clearly, they weren't willing to listen. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would do in those situations, he would tell Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be patient. And also at the same time, he would remind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that this is something which is not new. Every single prophet and messenger of Allah, when they were sent to their people, the people would always ask them and make silly demands. Take the example of Sayyiduna Musa alayhi salam. When you look through the Quran, the Banu Israel, they made so many silly demands on Sayyiduna Musa alayhi salam. Oh, show us Allah, you know, show us this, show us that. When Allah subhanahu gave them a simple order to sacrifice the cow, they then are started asking, oh, uh, what kind of cow is he, you know, what color cow is he, and so on and so forth. So this is something which is not new. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be consoled by Allah in terms of, look, look at Musa alayhi wa sallam and look how much suffering he did when the Banu Israel would make silly demands. He would not react, he would not feel disheartened. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, uh, or this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoled Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by telling Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not to worry. And when the time is suitable, when it is appropriate, then I will show them the miracles, then I will show them the mu'jiza. It's not necessary that, or it's not like you, whenever they want a miracle, I'm going to show it to them. No, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants in His own time, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thinks that this is appropriate, this is the time to show miracles, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just show the miracle. And remember, miracles are there, we'll probably touch on this next week in a bit more detail. Miracles are there just to show to everyone that this person is a true prophet of Allah 
is a true messenger of Allah and also at the same time to you know make everyone aware and alert to believe in this particular person. So these are the main reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent miracles and even at that time there was already a living miracle there and that was the miracle of the Holy Quran. But obviously as I said before that they were asking for miracles not with the intention to believe in Allah and the Rasul but they were asking so that they can be rebellious and they can cause more uh, pain to Rasulullah by not accepting. Because look, when you show someone something clear and they don't believe, you get more departed, it hurts you more. It's like someone you've been teaching for so long and then afterwards he then says, oh, well, I don't, no, I don't listen to you, I don't believe in you, what you were preaching was wrong, it will hurt you more. So the main reason why they would not believe in Rasulullah in particular the miracle is so that they want to give that more pain and more tatli to Rasulullah as I was saying in last week's lesson regarding Abu Lahab, that whenever there was an opportunity, he would always try to give taklif and pain to Rasulullah and try to hurt Rasulullah.